This Filmmaker IQ course is proudly sponsored by Lens Pro to Go, the best online rental service with a huge selection for all your project needs. Next time you need a piece of gear, check out my favorite rental site, Lens Pro to Go. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com, and today we'll tackle the important topic of copyright. Dig deep into the history and understand why this piece of legal thinking is absolutely crucial for our modern media age. For most of human history, there has not been a need for copyright. If you were a musician or an artist in ancient Rome, you were paid for your work and that was that. The whole notion of copying and distributing art for profit was completely foreign. You have to remember that for most of history, the vast majority of people were completely illiterate. Uh, those who were able to read and write were part of the nobility or part of the church. In an Irish church around the 6th century AD, we get the first inkling of copyright. Uh, St. Columba was an Irish Gaelic missionary from a well-to-do family. He was dedicated to constant prayer and studying and was responsible for transcribing over 300 books by hand. Now, one night he borrowed a copy of the Insular Psalter, a volume containing the Book of Psalms, a very rare thing in ancient Ireland. The Psalter, borrowed perhaps without his permission, belonged to St. Finian. In a single night, by a miraculous light, Columba copied the entire thing by hand. St. Finian was angry when he found out about this trespass and demanded the copy of the book back. Well, St. Columba defended himself saying, it was the word of God and it needed to be spread across the land. Well, they took their argument to the king for arbitration. The king sided with Finian saying, to every cow belongs her calf, therefore to every book belongs its copy. Uh, Columba didn't like this ruling one bit and used his influences to start a rebellion. The dispute resulted in the Battle of Kol Dremne in 561, ending with 3,000 warriors dead. Columba won the battle, so he got to keep the copy of the book, but he was forced into exile. He took 12 companions to settle in Iona in Scotland. There, the copied Psalter became the Cata of St. Columba and a rallying cry and battle protectorate for the clan O'Donnell. And that's that for copyright until technology and politics enter the fray a thousand years later. Once Western civilization had perfected the machinery necessary for creating movable type and the printing press in the 15th and 16th century, we begin to see the beginnings of real copyright. It was the powerful literate institutions, the government and the church that took to the printing press, using it to spread their message throughout the land quickly and cheaply through the written word. But they also realized it could be used to spread undesirable words. So they began to put in place regulations to try to control the output of the press. Pope Alexander VI issued a papal bull in 1501 against the unlicensed printing of books. And in 1559, the Index Expurgatorius, or List of Prohibited Books, was issued for the first time. Governments began to force printers to obtain official licenses to trade and produce books. Play nice with the king or the monarch and the printer would be granted an exclusive right to print certain works, in other words, a monopoly for a certain period of time. Now, this is exactly what happened in merry old England. The printers, bookmakers, and booksellers came together to create a guild, the worshipful company of stationers and newspaper makers, or the Stationers Company. Under the Royal Charter of 1557, the Stationers Company was given the express power to seize offending books that violated the standards set down by the church and state. And in exchange, they could control the market how they saw fit. The stationers were more interested in money than they were in politics, so they just went along with it, supporting the Catholics or the Protestants, whoever held the crown in England at the time. 
Now, as years passed by, the stationers grew more powerful, but the need for tight censorship of books began to wane after the English Civil War displaced the king with a parliamentary government. Without a king, the stationers' monopoly was not that politically useful. Authors like John Locke started to realize that the stationers' monopoly meant they could squeeze the authors economically. So in 1693, when it came time to extend the stationers' charter, Parliament, with the encouragement of Locke and independent printing presses, denied the extension. Well, that resulted in a bit of economic chaos. If the Crown no longer deemed a group in control of the right to copy works, who did? Well, the timing was just right. Under the stationer's reign, there was only one official London newspaper, the London Gazette. With the stationer's monopoly broken, newspapers popped up all over, and many were heavily bent toward the newly formed parliamentary political parties, the Whigs and the Tories. The parties recognized the importance of using news media for propaganda almost immediately. So all attempts by the stationers to reinstate the licensing act fell on deaf ears. But having nothing on the books in regards to copyright wasn't going to work either. Author Jonathan Swift wrote, one man studies seven year to bring a finished piece into the world and a pirate printer reprints his copy immediately and sells it for a quarter of the price. These things call for an act of parliament. Now, the stationers began to realize that it might be in their best interest to support the authors. They couldn't get perpetual licenses for themselves, but if they got the authors their license and copyright, the authors would have to come to the stationers to get their stuff printed. It was a win-win. What was good for the authors would be good for the publishers. Now, using this new tactic, the stationers petitioned Parliament again in both 1707 and 1709 to introduce a bill providing for copyright. Now, both bills failed, but the pressure was on to act. In 1710, three members of Parliament drafted a bill for the encouragement of learning and for securing the property of copies of books to the rightful owners thereof. The bill fined anyone who imported or traded in unlicensed or foreign books, required every book be registered in the stationer's register to receive copyright, term limits for the copyright were set to 14 years with the option to renew if the author was still alive for an additional 14 years. Now implicit in this bill, which can be known as the Statute of Anne in 1710, is a social quid pro quo to authors of literature. If you, the author, will create a piece of work, we will grant you a certain period of time which you, and only you, will be able to make money off of that work. And then after that time, society will own your creation and anyone can use it for free. The United States has a very interesting relationship to England. Born of Her Majesty's royal colonial womb, the U.S. also borrows a lot of British ideas while at the same time mixing in her own thinking. From the Federalist Papers number 43, James Madison argued that the federal government needed to have power to instate copyright. That would be no good for interstate commerce to have a patchwork of different copyrights among the different states. And when Madison was part of the drafting of the U.S. Constitution in 1789, we get Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, granting Congress the power, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, end quote. Then in 1790, we get the first Copyright Act, which borrowed heavily from the Statute of Anne. To get a copyright, you had to pay to register and deposit a record at the Library of Congress. The term limit, like the English version, was set to 14 years after registration with an option to renew for an additional 14 years, provided the author was still alive. But this copyright law only extended to citizens of the United States. Cheap reprints of foreign authors, especially British authors who happened to write in the same language, were all the vogue in the former colonies. 
Publishers filled that demand without paying a cent in royalties. There was so much piracy that there's almost a complete lack of literary figures in early American history. Now, at this point, the early 1800s, the United States was, for the most part, a cultural pirate nation, freely taking the product of Europe, a land separated by a vast ocean that took weeks to transverse. When a nation is a cultural importer, weak copyright enforcement and short copyright term limits are favorable because they make art cheaper. But a hundred years later, the world is in a much more connected place and America would develop her own culture. And by the end of the 20th century, the United States would become the dominant cultural exporter to the world. Now, looking at this graph, we see an ever increasing term limits of copyright. First in 1831, which extended the first term to 28 years with the 14 years additional and adding music composition to the list of protected works. Then the 1909 act changed the renewal period to 28 years and added musical recordings and eventually motion picture in a 1912 amendment. Then in 1976, we get this bump up to life of the author plus 50 years and the so-called Mickey Mouse Sonny Bono Act of 1998, which shoots it up to life plus 70 years. This growing trend of copyright term looks like a correlation with the rise of US cultural power and the growth of large US media interests or the age of Mickey Mouse. Now, obviously it's a copyright conspiracy. Disney is strangling society's original quid pro quo deal in order to make an extra buck. Well, not so fast. It's a lot more complicated than that. If we take the same graph of American copyright term lengths and overlay France's copyright terms, the US copyright length isn't growing at all. It's catching up to terms already established in the European countries, a term set forth by an international treaty called the Berne Convention. The second half of the 1700s saw a huge rise in the growth of literature that accompanied literacy rates. By the 19th century, you had authors with international followings like Charles Dickens and Victor Hugo, but the copyright laws of the day only protected an author in one nation. A publisher could take an author's work, especially an internationally famous author, go to a neighboring nation, publish the work there, and not have to pay royalties to the author, which is similar to the issue Madison pointed out as a rationale to give the federal government control over states in regards to copyright. Now, Victor Hugo was very troubled by this and helped found the Association Literary et Artistique Internationale with the objective of coming up with an international convention of writers and artists' rights. Eight years after founding the organization, they drafted a commercial treaty first signed in Bern, Switzerland on September 9th, 1886. Now, this concept of copyright was a huge departure from the English and American copyright systems, where the English focused mainly on commerce. The Berne Convention draws from the French, focusing on authors' rights, including moral rights, but we'll get to that in a second. Although the first Berne Convention document didn't settle on a term limit, the 1908 Berlin Act amended the term limit to a minimum of life of the author plus 50 years. Individual signations could choose longer period. Uh, just like real property, intellectual property can be inherited in the family. So they figured two generations with each generation being 25 years. After all, most people know their family back about two generations. Now, after those 50 years, the work enters the public domain free for everyone to use. The original signatories of the Berne Convention included Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, Tunisia, and the United Kingdom. Now, not long after, most of Europe had signed the treaty. The United States sent delegation to observe the meetings, but did not sign. Now, why? Well, it was a mix of lax copyright enabling cheap cultural import 
and a 19th century attitude of American non-interventionalism in Europe, which goes all the way back to Washington warning of getting involved with entangling treaties of the old world. But as the power of American film and music industries grew in the 20th century and the US reversed its non-interventionalist attitude toward the world after World War II, American lawmakers tried to harmonize the U.S. laws with international standards, with the intent of eventually joining. The 1976 Copyright Act brought the United States into the Berne Convention, a minimum of life plus 50 years. And then in 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed the United States into the Berne Convention. The so-called Mickey Mouse Act of 1998 wasn't really about saving Mickey from the public domain. He's trademark anyways. It was about trying to keep up the speed with the European Union, which just set the term limit to life plus 70 years in 1993. Because life expectancies were getting longer and they figured two generations meant 70 years and media industry was so large that a work had financial value for much longer than it previously did. But there is an exception in the United States form of copyright that is distinctly different from the European model. The US has work for hire. That is copyright on something you hire someone to create. The copyright term length is set for 75 years after publication in 1976 and extended to 95 years from publication in 1998. For unpublished works, the length is 125 years after creation, in case an unpublished work sits around for 50 years or so without seeing the light of day. Now, most major US films are considered work for hire. In Europe, the director is considered the film's author, and the copyright stands for life of the director plus 70 years. The Berne Convention ushered in a completely new approach to copyright from the Statute of Anne and the original U.S. Constitution because, frankly, the world in the late 1800s and 1900s was in a different relationship to media and authorship than it was in the 1700s. Still, some of the underlying principles come from two different viewpoints on property. Under feudal England, all lands belonged to the king, although ownership of plots were allowed to those who would work the land. Now, this came down because England was really a conquered land by the Normans in 1066. The United States didn't start with feudalism, but the land that the states are carved out of started off as federal territory. The notion of ownership through working the land is alive and well up to the Homestead Acts of the 1800s, which encouraged Western migration, offering free land after you could prove a certain number of years of residence. Now, we still have debates about eminent domain, where the government can take private land for public use. So in this mindset, a utilitarian viewpoint is dominant. Whoever could put the property to use for the most common good was more important than who really owned it. This utilitarian view of property is even implicit in the copyright statutes themselves. Exclusive right was only a bargaining chip to encourage artists to create works for the common good. Artists and novelists take ideas and words, which are public domain and uncopyrightable, and rearrange them to create works. Like the land owned by the king, your plot of land, your artistic work, must be returned to the public sphere from whence it came. Now, on the continental Europe, thinking took a different path. There wasn't the same kind of feudal history that the Normans had when they conquered England. Instead, the continent borrowed from their ancient conquerors and modernized old Roman laws of ownership. Here, property was an extension of who a person is and how that person projects themselves onto the material world. In other words, part of who you are is what you own and what you create. To deprive a person of their property would be to deprive the person of being that person. 
The Napoleonic Code of 1804 following the French Revolution codifies property as a natural right, something that you are born with. This idea is so inherent to existence that even Napoleon said he himself with all his armies could not violate so sacred a trust as property ownership. So if we have strong property rights, then we must have strong intellectual property rights. Just because the property is a work of the mind, an intellectual work, doesn't make it less work. If anything, it makes it more personable. To read the writings of an author is to go inside their head. To take away the author's claim to his or her own work while they're still alive is to deprive that person of what makes that person. Well, this includes something new, moral rights. An author has a right to have a say in what happens to their stories and what happens to the characters he or she creates. As outlined by the Byrne Convention, the author shall have the right to claim authorship of the work and to object to any distortion, modification of, or other derogatory action in relation to that said work, which would be prejudicial to the author's honor or reputation. Also unique in the Berne Convention, and perhaps one of the less understood and less appreciated shifts in copyright thinking, was the concept of copyright exists at the moment of creation. When an idea is fixed in a tangible form, that, that's key right there, it must be written down or committed to a tangible medium. It is instantly copyrighted. You own it without having to register it. Now, there is a bureau where you can register to make a record that you created that form of expression in order to get statutory damages when you're arguing infringement or suing for infringement. But this focus on author's rights means the author creates the right. It comes naturally, not from the government. The government is just there to be an arbitrator if you need it, but you don't have to go to the government to get your rights. So our modern take on copyright may be born out of the struggles of stationers and censorship laid, by, laid down by the church and crown, but the underlying motives are educated by the French and the concept of natural rights to property. The absolutely frustrating thing when researching this subject matter online is the blatant, almost universal omission of the Berne Convention in the vast majority of layman and scholarly articles on copyright history. So much of what's written online and popular videos discussing the topic completely skip the 19th century as though it never happened. But I guess you have to consider the source. Most of these papers online were written by researchers writing for library special interest groups in the 90s when Congress was debating copyright term extensions, making the argument a constitutional argument instead of an international economic question was a political tactic to sway Congress members. The internet, which thrives on free content, picked up the ideas without context. The omission of natural property rights that Berne Convention gives us plays into the utilitarian argument of a greater social good, or at least the perception of that. The danger is it's a one-sided argument that ignores the developing philosophies that shape modern copyright. Without considering those philosophies, which have been evolving alongside a creative media economy worth billions and billions of dollars in the last century, the arguments are meaningless and the solutions coming out of them are dangerous at best. Is the current term too long? Well, maybe it is. No one really knows what's the ideal term length. But if anything, the current term limit isn't the engine of a cultural apocalypse. We've had longer copyright terms for a while, but culture is thriving right now, especially because of technology. Now, sure, there are problems. Copyright, like every human legal institution, needs to be tailored for changing times. And unfortunately, it has to be in a perpetual state of catching up because you can't predict what society will do next. But when we make changes, we have to do it responsibly. I wrote this copyright history to make it accessible to as many as possible. I believe law can always be boiled down to questions of fairness. Even a nine-year-old could think about an answer. Unfortunately, the lawyers and legalese get in the way.
To go deep into the history of what we covered would take, be enough to jam-pack an entire semester at law school. And we haven't even discussed fair use, which absolutely has to be a strong defense if we're to protect freedom of speech in a strong copyright world. Copyright is a key issue, not just for filmmakers and content creators, but for the viewing audience as well. Now, go out there and toil and make something you can call your own and know that it belongs to you because it's your copyright. Make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com. 